The Battle of the Dnieper was a military campaign that took place in 1943 on the Eastern Front of World War II. It was one of the largest operations in World War II, involving almost 4 million troops stretched on a 1,400 kilometers (870 miles) long front. During its four-month duration, the eastern bank of the Dnieper was recovered from German forces by five of the Red Army's fronts, which conducted several assault river crossings to establish several lodgements on the western bank. Subsequently, Kiev was liberated in the Battle of Kiev. 2,438 Red Army soldiers were awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union which was more than had been awarded previously since the awards establishment and never again was there such a large number of laureates. Strategic situation Following the Battle of Kursk, the Wehrmacht's here and supporting Luftwaffe forces in the southern Soviet Union were on the defensive in the southern Ukraine. By mid-August, Adolf Hitler understood that the forthcoming Soviet offensive could not be contained on the open steppe and ordered construction of a series of fortifications along the line of the Dnieper River. On the Soviet side, Joseph Stalin was determined to launch a major offensive in Ukraine. The main thrust of the offensive was in a southwesterly direction, the northern flank being largely stabilized, the southern flank rested on the Sea of Azov. Planning Soviet planning The operation began on 26 August 1943. Divisions started to move on a 1,400-kilometer front that stretched between Smolensk and the Sea of Azov. Overall, the operation would be executed by 36 combined arms, 4 tank and 5 air armies. 2,650,000 personnel were brought into the ranks for this massive operation. The operation would use 51,000 guns, 2,400 tanks and 2,850 planes. The Dnieper is the third largest river in Europe, behind only the Volga and the Danube. In its lower part, its width can easily reach 3 km, and being dammed in several places made it even larger. Moreover, its western shore—the one still to be retaken—was much higher and steeper than the eastern, complicating the offensive even further. In addition, the opposite shore was transformed into a vast complex of defenses and fortifications held by the Wehrmacht. Faced with such a situation, the Soviet commanders had two options. The first would be to give themselves time to regroup their forces, find a weak point or two to exploit not necessarily in the lower part of the Dnieper, stage a breakthrough and encircle the German defenders far in the rear, rendering the defense line unsupplied and next to useless very much like the German panzers bypassed the Maginot Line in 1940. This option was supported by Marshal Zhukov and Deputy Chief of Staff A. I. Antonov, who considered the substantial losses after the fierce Battle of Kursk. The second option would be to stage a massive assault without waiting, and force the Dnieper on a broad front. This option left no additional time for the German defenders, but would lead to much larger casualties than would a successful deep operation breakthrough. This second option was backed by Stalin due to the concern that the German scorched earth Policy might devastate this region if the Red Army did not advance fast enough. Stavka the Soviet High Command chose the second option. Instead of deep penetration and encirclement, the Soviet intended to make full use of partisan activities to intervene and disrupt Germany's supply route so that the Germans could not effectively send reinforcements or take away Soviet industrial facilities in the region. Stavka also paid high attention to the possible scorched earth activities of German forces with a view to preventing them by a rapid advance. The assault was staged on a 300-kilometer front almost simultaneously. All available means of transport were to be used to transport the attackers to the opposite shore, including small fishing boats and improvised rafts of barrels and trees like the one in the photograph. The preparation of the crossing equipment was further complicated by the German scorched earth strategy with the total destruction of all boats and raft building material in the area. The crucial issue would obviously be heavy equipment. Without it, the bridgeheads would not stand for long. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Soviet organization. Central Front known as the Belarusian Front after the 20th of October 1943 commanded by Konstantin Rokossovsky and accounted for 579,600 soldiers took no part in the Dnieper battle after the 3rd of October 
Second Tank Army, led by Alexei Rodan, Semyon Bogdanov since September. Ninth Tank Corps, led by Raihori Rudchenko, Kia, Boris Bakarov. Sixtieth Army, led by Ivan Cherniakovsky. Thirteenth Army, led by Nikolai Pakov. Sixty-fifth Army, led by Pavel Batov. Sixty-first Army, led by Pavel Belov. Forty-eighth Army, led by Prokofi Romanenko. Seventieth Army, led by Ivan Galanin, Vladimir Sharapov, September to October, Alexei Grechkin, since October. 16th Air Army, led by Sergei Rudenko Voronezh Front known as the First Ukrainian Front after 20 October 1943, commanded by Nikolai Vedatin and accounted for 665,500 soldiers 3rd Guards Tank Army, led by Pavel Rybolko 1st Tank Army, led by Mikhail Katakov 4th Guards Tank Corps, led by Pavel Poluboyarov 1st Guard Cavalry Corps, led by Viktor Baranov 5th Guards Army, led by Alexei Zadov 4th Guards Army, led by Grigory Kulik, Alexei Zygin Kia, Ivan Galanin 6th Guards Army, led by Ivan Chistyakov 38th Army, led by Nikon Dr. Chibasov, Kirill Moskalenko since October 47th Army, led by Pavel Korzin, Filip Zikmachenko September to October, Vitaly Polenov since October 27th Army, led by Sergei Trofimenko 52nd Army, led by Konstantin Korotayev 2nd Air Army, led by Stepan Krasovsky Steppe Front known as the 2nd Ukrainian Front after 20 October 1943, commanded by Ivan Konev Southwestern Front known as the 3rd Ukrainian Front after 20 October 1943, commanded by Rodion Malinovsky Southern Front known as the 4th Ukrainian Front after the 20th of October 1943 commanded by Fyodor Tolbukhin Topic <laughs> German planning The order to construct the Dnieper defense complex known as Eastern Wall was issued on the 11th of August 1943 and began to be immediately executed Fortifications were erected along the length of the Dnieper However, there was no hope of completing such an extensive defensive line in the short time available. Therefore, the completion of the Eastern Wall was not uniform in its density and depth of fortifications. Instead, they were concentrated in areas where a Soviet assault crossing were most likely to be attempted, such as near Kremenchik, Zaporizhia and Nikopol. Additionally, on 7 September 1943, the SS forces and the Wehrmacht received orders to implement a scorched earth policy, by stripping the areas they had to abandon of anything that could be used by the Soviet war effort. <laughs> <laughs> German organization Luftflot II selected units Wolfram Freiherr von Richthofen In Ukraine Army Group South, Erich von Manstein 4th Panzer Army, Hermann Hoth 1st Panzer Army, Eberhard von Mackensen 8th Army, Otto Wohler 6th Army, Karl Adolf Hollett transferred to Army Group A control Luftflotte 4 Wolfram Freiherr von Richthofen, Otto Delich since September In Crimea Army Group A, Ewald von Kleist Army Group Center, Gunther von Kluge 2nd Army, Walter Way took no part in the Dnieper battle after 3 October. Topic. Description of the strategic operation Topic. Initial attack Despite a great superiority in numbers, the offensive was by no means easy. German opposition was ferocious and the fighting raged for every town and city. The Wehrmacht made extensive use of rear guards, leaving some troops in each city and on each hill, slowing down the Soviet offensive. Topic. Progress of the offensive Three weeks after the start of the offensive, and despite heavy losses on the Soviet side, it became clear that the Germans could not hope to contain the Soviet offensive in the flat, open terrain of the steppes, where the Red Army's numerical strength would prevail. Manstein asked for as many as 12 new divisions in the hope of containing the Soviet offensive, but German reserves were perilously thin. 
On 15 September 1943, Hitler ordered Army Group South to retreat to the Dnieper defense line. The battle for Poltava was especially bitter. The city was heavily fortified and its garrison well prepared. After a few inconclusive days that greatly slowed down the Soviet offensive, Marshal Konev decided to bypass the city and rush towards the Dnieper. After two days of violent urban warfare, the Poltava garrison was overcome. Towards the end of September 1943, Soviet forces reached the lower part of the Dnieper. Topic. Dnieper airborne operation The following is, largely, a synopsis of an account by Glantz with support from an account by Staskov. Stavka detached the Central Front's 3rd Tank Army to the Voronezh Front to race the weakening Germans to the Dnieper, to save the wheat crop from the German scorched earth policy, and to achieve strategic or operational river bridgeheads before a German defense could stabilize there. The 3rd Tank Army, plunging headlong, reached the river on the night of 21–22 September and, on the 23rd, Soviet infantry forces crossed by swimming and by using makeshift rafts to secure small, fragile bridgeheads, opposed only by 120 German Cherkasy Flak Academy NCO candidates and the hard-pressed 19th Panzer Division Reconnaissance Battalion, those forces were the only Germans within 60 km of the Dnieper Loop. Only a heavy German air attack and a lack of bridging equipment kept Soviet heavy weaponry from crossing and expanding the bridgehead. The Soviets, sensing a critical juncture, ordered a hasty airborne corps assault to increase the size of the bridgehead before the Germans could counterattack. On the 21st, the Voronezh Front's 1st, 3rd and 5th Guards Airborne Brigades got the urgent call to secure, on the 23rd, a bridgehead perimeter 15 to 20 km wide and 30 km deep on the Dnieper loop between Kniv and Rz Hashev, while front elements forced the river. The arrival of personnel at the airfields was slow, necessitating, on the 23rd, a one-day delay and omission of 1st Brigade from the plan. Consequent mission changes caused near chaos in command channels. Mission change orders finally got down to company commanders, on the 24th, just 15 minutes before their units, not yet provisioned with spades, anti-tank mines, or ponchos for the autumn night frosts, assembled on airfields. Owing to the weather, not all assigned aircraft had arrived at airfields on time, if at all. Further, most flight safety officers disallowed maximum loading of their aircraft. Given fewer aircraft and lower than expected capacities, the master loading plan, ruined, was abandoned. Many radios and supplies got left behind. In the best case, it would take three lifts to deliver the two brigades. Units, still arriving by the overtaxed rail system, were loaded piecemeal onto returned aircraft, which were slow to refuel owing to the less than expected capacities of fuel trucks. Meanwhile, already arrived troops changed planes, seeking earlier flights. Urgency and the fuel shortage prevented aerial assembly aloft. Most aircraft, as soon as they were loaded and fueled, flew in single file, instead of line abreast, to the dropping points. Assault waves became as intermingled as the units they carried. As core elements made their flights, troops, half of whom had never jumped, except from training towers, were briefed on drop zones, assembly areas and objectives only poorly understood by platoon commanders still studying new orders. Meanwhile, Soviet aerial photography, suspended for several days by bad weather, had missed the strong reinforcement of the area, early that afternoon. Non-combat cargo pilots ferrying 3rd Brigade through Drizzle expected no resistance beyond river pickets but, instead, were met by anti-aircraft fire and starshells from the 19th Panzer Division only coincidentally transiting the drop zone, and just one of six divisions and other formations ordered, on the 21st, to fill the gap in front of the 3rd Tank Army. Lead aircraft, disgorging paratroopers over Dubari at 1930, came under fire from elements of the 73rd Panzer Grenadier Regiment and Division Staff of 19th Panzer Division. Some paratroops began returning fire and throwing grenades even before landing, trailing aircraft accelerated, climbed and evaded, dropping wide. Through the night, some pilots avoided starshell lit drop points entirely, and 13 aircraft returned to airfields without having dropped at all. Intending a 10 by 14 km drop over largely undefended terrain, the Soviets instead achieved a 30 by 90 km drop over the fastest mobile elements of two German corps. On the ground, the Germans used white parachutes as beacons to hunt down and kill disorganized groups and to gather and destroy airdropped supplies. Supply bonfires, glowing embers, and multi-color starshells illuminated the battlefield. 
Captured documents gave the Germans enough knowledge of Soviet objectives to arrive at most of them before the disorganized paratroops. Back at the Soviet airfields, the fuel shortage allowed only 298 of 500 planned sorties, leaving core anti-tank guns and 2017 paratroops undelivered. Of 4,575 men dropped 70% of the planned number, and just 1,525 from 5th Brigade, some 2,300 eventually assembled into 43 ad hoc groups, with missions abandoned as hopeless, and spent most of their time seeking supplies not yet destroyed by the Germans. Others joined with the nine partisan groups operating in the area. About 230 made it over or out of the Dnieper to front units or were originally dropped there. Most of the rest were almost casually captured that first night or killed the next day although, on that first night, the 3rd Co., 73rd Panzer Grenadier Regiment, suffered heavy losses while annihilating about 150 paratroopers near Grishevo, some 3 kilometers west of Dubari. The Germans underestimated that 1,500 to 2,000 had dropped, they recorded 901 paratroops captured and killed in the first 24 hours. Thereafter, they largely ignored the Soviet paratroopers, to counterattack and truncate the Dnieper bridgeheads. The Germans deemed their anti-paratrooper operations completed by the 26th, although a modicum of opportunistic actions against garrisons, rail lines, and columns were conducted by remnants up to early November. For a lack of manpower to clear all areas, forests of the region would remain a minor threat. The Germans called the operation a fundamentally sound idea ruined by the dilettantism of planners lacking expert knowledge but praised individual paratroops for their tenacity, bayonet skills and deft use of broken ground in the sparsely wooded northern region. Stavka deemed this second and, ultimately, last corps drop a complete failure, lessons they knew they had already learned from their winter offensive corps drop at Vyazma had not stuck. They would never trust themselves to try it again. Soviet 5th Guards Airborne Brigade Commander Sidorchuk, withdrawing to the forests south, eventually amassed a brigade size command, half paratroops, half partisans. He obtained air supply, and assisted the 2nd Ukrainian Front over the Dnieper near Cherkasy to finally link up with front forces on 15 November. After 13 more days' combat, the airborne element was evacuated, ending a harrowing two months. More than 60% never returned. Topic. Assault crossing the Dnieper The first bridgehead on the Dnieper's western shore was established on of September 1943 at the confluence of the Dnieper and Pripyat rivers, in the northern part of the front. On 24 September, another bridgehead was created near Dniprodzerzhensk, another on 25 September near Dnipropovosk and yet another on 28 September near Kremenchik. By the end of the month, 23 bridgeheads were created on the western side, some of them 10 km wide and 1 to 2 km deep. The crossing of the Dnieper was extremely difficult. Soldiers used every available floating device to cross the river, under heavy German fire and taking heavy losses. Once across, Soviet troops had to dig themselves into the clay ravines composing the Dnieper's western bank. Topic. Securing the lodgements. German troops soon launched heavy counterattacks on almost every bridgehead, hoping to annihilate them before heavy equipment could be transported across the river. For instance, the Borodesk lodgement, mentioned by Marshal Konev in his memoirs, came under heavy armored attack and air assault. Bombers attacked both the lodgement and the reinforcements crossing the river. Konev complained at once about a lack of organization of Soviet air support, set up air patrols to prevent bombers from approaching the lodgements and ordered forward more artillery to counter tank attacks from the opposite shore. When Soviet aviation became more organized and hundreds of guns and Katyusha rocket launchers began firing, the situation started to improve and the bridgehead was eventually preserved. Such battles were commonplace on every lodgement. Although all the lodgements were held, losses were terrible. At the beginning of October, most divisions were at only 25 to 50 percent of their nominal strength. Topic: <laughs> Lower Dnieper Offensive. By mid-October, the forces accumulated on the Lower Dnieper bridgeheads were strong enough to stage a first massive attack to definitely secure the river's western shore in the southern part of the front. Therefore, a vigorous attack was staged on the Kremenchik-Nipropovosk line. 
Simultaneously, a major diversion was conducted in the south to draw German forces away both from the Lower Dnieper and from Kiev. At the end of the offensive, Soviet forces controlled a bridgehead 300 km wide and up to 80 km deep in some places. In the south, the Crimea was now cut off from the rest of the German forces. Any hope of stopping the Red Army on the Dnieper's east bank was lost. Outcomes The Battle of the Dnieper was another defeat for a Wehrmacht that required it to restabilize the front further west. The Red Army, which Hitler hoped to contain at the Dnieper, forced the Wehrmacht's defenses. Kiev was recaptured and German troops lacked the forces to annihilate Soviet troops on the lower Dnieper bridgeheads. The West Bank was still in German hands for the most part, but both sides knew that it would not last for long. Additionally, the Battle of the Dnieper demonstrated the strength of the Soviet partisan movement. The Rail War operation staged during September and October 1943 struck German logistics very hard, creating heavy supply issues. Incidentally, between 28 November and 1 December 1943 the Tehran Conference was held between Winston Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Stalin. The Battle of the Dnieper, along with other major offensives staged in 1943, certainly gave Stalin a dominant position for negotiating with his allies. Topic. Soviet operational phases From a Soviet operational point of view, the battle was broken down into a number of different phases and offensives. The first phase of the battle Chernikov Poltava Strategic Offensive 26 August 1943 to 30 September 1943 Central, Voronezh and Steppe Fronts Chernikov Pripyat Offensive 26 August to 30 September 1943 Sumy Priluki Offensive 26 August to 30 September 1943 Poltava Kremenchug Offensive 26 August to 30 September 1943 Donbass Strategic Offensive 13 August to of September 1943 Southwestern and Southern Fronts Dnieper Airborne Assault 24 September to 24 November 1943 The second phase of the operation includes Lower Dnieper Offensive 26 September to 20 December 1943 Melitopol Offensive 26 September to 5 November 1943 Zaporizhia Offensive 10-14 October 1943 Kremenchug Piatikotki Offensive 15 October to 3 November 1943 Nepropovosk Offensive 23 October to 23 December 1943 Kravoy Raj Offensive 14 to 21 November 1943 Apostolovo Offensive the 14th of November to the 23rd of December 1943 Nikopol Offensive the 14th of November to the 31st of December 1943 Alexandria Zinamenka Offensive the 22nd of November to the 9th of December 1943 Kravoy Raj Offensive 10 to 19 December 1943 Kiev Strategic Offensive Operation October 1 to 24 October 1943 Chernobyl Radomizil Offensive Operation 1 to 4 October 1943 Chernobyl Gornostypol Defensive Operation 3 to 8 October 1943 Lyotesh Offensive Operation 11 to 24 October 1943 Bukharin Offensive Operation 12 to 15 October 1943 Bukharin Offensive Operation 21 to 24 October 1943 Kiev Strategic Offensive 3 to 13 November 1943 Ross November 1943 Counterattack Kiev Strategic Defensive the 13th of November to the 22nd of December 1943 Topic References Topic. Citations Topic. Bibliography Freiser, Karl Heinz, Schmeider, Klaus, Schonher, Klaus, Schreiber, Gerhard, Ungvari, Christian, Wegner, Berndt 
Die Ostfront 1943-44 Der Krieg im Osten und in den Nebenfronten The Eastern Front 1943-1944, The War in the East and on the Neighboring Fronts. Das Deutsche Reich und der Zweit Weltkrieg Germany and the Second World War in German. 8. München, Deutsche Verlagsanstalt. ISBN 978-3-421-06235-2. David M. Glantz, Jonathan M. House, When Titans Clashed, How the Red Army Stopped Hitler, University Press of Kansas, 1995 Nikolai Shefov, Russian Fights, Lib. Military History, Moscow, 2002 History of Great Patriotic War, 1941-1945. Moscow, 1963 John Erickson, Barbarossa, The Axis and the Allies, Edinburgh University Press, 1994 Marshall Konev, Notes of a Front Commander, Science, Moscow, 1972 Eric von Manstein, Lost Victories, Moscow, 1957